Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are watching Flick Connection, the show that connects you with the best movies on streaming, and today we're going to be talking about the weirdest movies on Netflix that are still well worth watching. So this is going to be a list of 20 movies currently included on Netflix in the US. Availability will change over time and may be different from country to country. So make sure you have that subscribe button and the little bell icon clicked if you want to watch these videos as soon as I put them out. That way you can catch the movies before they're gone. This video is sponsored by Incogni. I'll be telling you more about them later in the video. But let's go ahead and get this list started with my number 20 pick, The One. This is an action sci-fi flick starring Jet Li, and it's one of the few sci-fi movies he ever did, and it happens to be a pretty exceptional one. However, I do recall feeling this movie looked dated even back when it came out, so it looks even more dated today. In fact, for an action sci-fi movie, it has a fairly low budget look, but in an age where we've got tons of movies with high production values and thin stories, Here's a pretty good one with lower production value and stronger story, especially for a martial arts based sci-fi movie. This one deals with some really cool stuff, including parallel universes. So if that sounds like you, on a list of 20, we're starting off with a bang. Now I did rank these in terms of how strong the recommendation is, not how weird the movies are, and my number 19 pick on this list is one of the weirdest, the Block Island Sound. The island is a totally different beast this time of year. What's going on down at West Beach? Well, we got a bit of a fish problem. Now this was just added to Netflix in the last year or so, and it's a recent indie release. It's fairly low budget, but for such a low budget movie, the Black Island Sound actually has a really dark, deep, consistent mood. It's got kind of a Lovecraftian thing going on, and some very strange characters. In fact, that's kind of the weirdest thing about this movie. Even though it's in the fantasy sci-fi genre, the characters, again, on the island, some of them are just so bizarre, it kind of sets the movie off a little bit. It adds a little bit of extra flavor, especially if you're into weird or indie flicks. Another weird indie flick that's got a slow pace similar to the Black Island sound, with a much bigger budget and cast, but an even bigger name director with Dave Franco. This is actually his first feature film. No, he's not in it. He is in the director's chair for this one, and I think he did a pretty good job if you go into the rental with the right expectations, which is honestly going to be low to no expectations. And that's because this isn't really a horror movie. It's about a group of friends that meet at this rental house who is owned by this really, again, bizarre character played by Toby Huss, who is currently like one of my favorite character actors. He's had some just really killer little roles lately. If you saw Cop Shop, you know what I'm talking about. But the rental eventually goes into some dark territory. It just takes a while to get there. Don't go into this expecting a action-packed horror movie, and I think the rental might have some surprises in it for you. Now we jump to the only family-friendly movie on this list, and it's a bit of a doozy because it features Chris Rock, Bill Murray, and Lawrence Fishburne in Osmosis Jones. What I love about Osmosis Jones is it mixes this great throwback, hand-drawn animation style with a live-action Bill Murray. In this movie, Murray plays this really disgusting guy who gets sick, and most of the movie takes place inside his body, and it's this neo-noir action-adventure movie inside all of Bill Murray's internal organs. So not only is it funny, and of course there's gonna be some fart jokes, but not only is it funny, it's also a little educational for kids because of the anatomy elements. However, it does have a darker edge and I wouldn't really recommend this for very, very young kids, but still just kind of a fun throwback movie that's a little bit wackier than a lot of the stuff that's coming out today for kids. Now my next pick is from one of my all-time favorite directors, but it's actually one of my least favorite movies of his. It still gets this ranking on the list because it's still that good. I'm talking about Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak. 
Now Crimson Peak has a lot going for it. It's got a fantastic cast, some really great roles, including Jessica Chastain. I always enjoy her work, but she's particularly fun to watch in this movie. But above everything else is just the visuals. Most of what you see are real sets Obviously, they're enhanced a bit, but Guillermo del Toro just brings this beautiful gothic world to life in this movie. It really is a stunner of a horror movie, even if the story gets a little bit thin and kind of falls flat ultimately, especially for something done by Guillermo del Toro. Again, that's really my big gripe with the movie, which is not a small one, but still, this movie's so well produced, it's still kind of a joy to watch. Now something else that has been a total joy for me lately is today's sponsor, Incogni. Now I just signed up for my Incogni account a little over a week ago, so less than two weeks, and they have already dramatically reduced the amount of spam phone calls I'm getting. Honestly, I've had the same phone number since high school, and the spam calls have gotten out of control lately, but Incogni has reduced them almost to nothing, again, in less than two weeks. Also, sometime last year, I was engaging another sponsor, and when I signed up on their website, I immediately got got tons of spam hitting my folder, so much so that my spam folder would have a hundred entries a day. Obviously, they never became a sponsor, I wouldn't do that to you guys, but again, in less than two weeks, Incogni has dramatically reduced the amount hitting my spam folder, and it's continuing to come down. That's because Incogni has already reached out to some of these data brokers who are always trading our information without our knowledge. They've already reached out to about a hundred of those companies for me and had my my personal data removed from 22 companies with 88 still being processed. And that's what Incogni does. You have the right to tell these companies to delete your personal data to help protect your privacy. The trouble is it would take you forever to contact all of them independently and deal with the back and forth that would follow. Incogni does that for a low monthly rate. And right now when my viewers use the link in the video description and use my code code Flick Connection, you're going to save 20% off your first order with Incogni. It was super easy to set up my account and I'm really happy with the results so far. Again, use my link in the description and my code Flick Connection and you're going to save 20%. But let's go ahead and move on with the rest of the 20 movies featured on this list. My next pick is a Netflix original from a legendary director, Jean-Pierre Jeunette. His movies, his most famous ones, include Amelie and Delicatessen. And his latest film, again, is a Netflix original, Big Bug. Now, again, a director I really like, not one of my favorite movies of him, but still a really weird Netflix original. It takes place in this Jetsons-like future where a bug in the system begins to cause machines to behave differently. This one is fairly slow paced, but it has a lot of funny, interesting dialogue. And Jean-Pierre Jeunet's work to me over time feels more and more circus-like. It's very performative and has kind of an old fashioned feel to it and Big Bug is like to another level. The next closest director would be like Terry Gilliam or something like that. So if you're fans of those movies, Terry Gilliam's work, then Big Bug is a really cool Netflix original movie. But if you're not already tapped into that, I do not recommend making this your first Jean-Pierre Jeunet movie. I would highly recommend either Delicatessen or Amelie above that one because his work really is fantastic and either one of those will get you into it much better than Big Bug will. My next pick makes this list for a couple of reasons. One is because it's a drama starring Will Ferrell. There are not many of those, that's automatically weird. But he's also playing a man in the middle of a divorce who decides to sell all of his belongings on his front lawn. So that's pretty weird too. And in this movie, his character deals with a lot of emotions while camping out on this front lawn, interacting with the different people that come along the way and are buying off things that used to mean a lot to him. So this movie actually has quite a bit of weight to it considering it doesn't have a very big scope. Meaning it's a pretty slow paced indie movie but it's got a lot of heart to it, especially for a Will Ferrell movie. And I thought not only did he do a great job, but he also distanced himself from his famous characters. So you're not gonna be too distracted by it being Will Ferrell. He's funny at times, but 
he really made this character in this movie work in a way that I really would not have expected him to. Okay, now, it's a list of weird movies, and my next pick is not only really weird, it's also very dark and very grim, so, you know, you've been warned. But Cam is about a Cam girl, if you're not familiar with that term. It's essentially an independent porn star, and weird things start to happen with her and her computer. Think Black Mirror type stuff. There's a dark sexual nature to this movie, and not in a typical way. The movie is actually fairly sex positive with regards to her profession, but the things that begin happening to her through this computer are somewhat supernatural in nature, and they're very strange, and it works. From the very first scene in Cam, you know nothing is what it seems, and that continues throughout, and this turned out to be a pretty cool little Netflix original that I know a lot of people missed back when it was originally released. But speaking of horror movies, I feel like the bench is pretty thin on Netflix right now, but a cool one that hit theaters just a couple of years ago and I think still didn't get the audience it deserves is Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Andy? Stella! Listen, you're in the next story. We're reading it right here. It's a corpse looking for her missing toe. <laughs> Now this is a horror anthology movie actually produced by Guillermo del Toro and I really liked this one. Now my understanding is it's based on a real book and fans of the book didn't like it as much but that's kind of par for the course with movies based on books. I personally love anthology movies and while I typically love ones that have a little bit more fun with the genre. Scary Stories is dark, grim, and has some really great monster design in it, more so than you normally get in a movie like this. In fact, Scary Stories at least has the appearance of a fairly big budget movie for an anthology film. Usually, they're lower budget, more independent, and this one, even though it's a little more polished than I generally like my horror movies, it still was full of some really great moments. My next one, is one that I found really disappointing back when it came out and I've grown to enjoy it more over time. And I was partly disappointed originally because of the potential in The Men Who Stare at Goats. Now, a lot of that potential is in the cast. You've got George Clooney, Ewan McGregor, Jeff Bridges, and a really wild story that's apparently loosely based on reality, and it's just wacky fun. This movie has not really transcended time. It's not become the Big Lebowski or anything like that, and maybe it could have had it been a little bit better, but if you've never seen it, it's a really wacky movie with a lot of fun moments in it. Jason Momoa stars in my next pick, but it also features some cameos from actors like Keanu Reeves and, believe it or not, Jim Carrey in The Bad Batch. Now this one is set in a post-apocalyptic wasteland of sorts, one very different from one you've seen in any other kind of movie, but it's sort of an exile zone, at least that's the gist you get from the beginning of the movie, and there are cannibals living there. So the weirdness is mounting, right? You've got a very interesting cast, a bizarre setup, and somehow an even more bizarre movie. This is from the same director as A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, an indie vampire movie that I love and have recommended on the channel before. And while The Bad Batch looks really cool and looks like something that might appeal to everyone, I will tell you this is an indie flick. It's slow paced. It's got some, again, some weird plot twists and elements that would not work for something Thing that was made for a major theatrical release that's for massive audiences people would have hated this movie but if you clicked on this video because you like weird stuff and you've never seen the Bad Batch do yourself a favor it's one of the cooler movies on Netflix right now my next pick is one of the smaller movies on this list, but it's got a cult following and a sequel. And here in this video, I'm actually recommending both as one thing to watch, and that is Creep and Creep 2. But for time, let me just give you the setup of the original creep in this movie. Mark Duplass plays this really weird creep of a character, and a journalist is following him around, learning about him for a video project. 
Mark Duplass is mainly the only person you see on screen for this entire movie, and it manages to work. You're very engaged in the weirdness of his character. He tells multiple stories and does multiple things that seem out of left field and keep you engaged with this movie, and it ultimately pays off. And then in Creep 2, he's back playing the same character, and somehow it still managed to work. I think it's equally as good as the original. The two of them together, they're two of the more interesting found footage movies I've seen over the last 10 years. Now we'll jump things up with not only a much bigger budget, but a huge cast with Keanu Reeves starring Al Pacino and Charlize Theron in The Devil's Advocate. Now, this was a big hit movie. It's got a lot of weird elements to it. One being Al Pacino's performance as Satan. Al Pacino is famous for big, over-the-top performances. When you think of him, a handful of them come to mind, like Scarface and Any Given Sunday, Heat. Give me all you got! This and Give me all you got! But in that list, you would have to include The Devil's Advocate. In fact, his performance is so big, grandiose, and over the top that you really kind of forget about anyone else's work in the movie. I honestly can't even tell you what accent Keanu Reeves is going with in this movie because Al Pacino steals the show. Now, this movie has not held up as a good movie, but it has held up as kind of this weird relic of the late 90s with this, again, classic over-the-top Pacino that does hold up. Classic over-the-top Pacino performances. Sin of the Woman is another one I did, forgot to point out. Those have not gone out of style, and The Devil's Advocate is a good example of one. My next pick might be my favorite Tim Burton movie of the 21st century, Big Fish. I am a big fan of Tim Burton's early work, including his first movie, Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Not such a big fan of his more recent work, Big Fish being a big exception. In fact, I may have teared up every time I've watched this movie. Not only do I love ultimately where this movie goes and how deep the story gets, I also love how fun a lot of the chapters are in this movie. If you've never seen it, it's essentially a dying father telling his son some of his final stories. And these stories are directed by Tim Burton. So they are over the top, they're fantasiful, but it's a really beautiful way to look at a father telling his son stories. And the real story underneath all of this is a wonderful story of a man's life, kind of a Forrest Gump type epic life story, but again, directed by Tim Burton with some just fantastic chapters, meaning the movie changes, the mood changes from chapter to chapter, and each one is wonderful in its own way. Again, if you've never seen it, Wonderful is a great word to describe this movie. It certainly is weird, but it's also one of the more wonderful things on Netflix right now. Now, longtime subscribers know I'm not shy about recommending foreign films, and lately I've recommended a handful from Spain. My next pick comes from Spain and features a very interesting science fiction plot. Mirage features a story about two electrical storms spread 25 years apart and a woman who begins to be able to communicate with the past. And in the mix of all of that, there's a murder and a missing child and only a short period of time to even figure out what is exactly going on. It's one of the more interesting time travel movies I've seen in recent years because this movie is only a few years old. It is Spanish language, but there is a dubbed version if you're allergic to subtitles. I am a sucker for westerns and weird movies, but let's be honest, there's not many weird westerns to choose from, but one of my all-time favorites is The Quick and the Dead. Now, right off the bat, I love the cast for this movie and think it's a weird mix-up of people. You've got Sharon Stone, who's effectively the lead. You've got a very young Leonardo DiCaprio. You've got Russell Crowe, well before Gladiator. In this epic western that takes place in a rickety old town where there seems to be a shootout or multiple shootouts every day. In fact, it's a tournament of sorts in this movie. The kills are over the top, the dialogue is over the top and fun and almost Tarantino-like at times. This movie's got a beautiful look to it that still holds up today. And even though none of it is realistic whatsoever, it is still just a wild ride of a western movie. 
Another one that's a wild, weird ride, but it takes place way out in space, is Starship Troopers. Now, this is a cult classic for a reason. Not only is it fun to watch these epic battles between Marines and oversized bugs, but the movie itself is a satire. There are a lot of tongue-in-cheek moments. It's very self-aware. This is directed by Paul Verhoeven, who also did Robocop, and a handful of other classic movies, also including Showgirls. But this is one of his cooler, weirder efforts. I would put this one up there with Robocop. They've made a bunch of sequels over the years. They were not done by him. They don't have the level of quality in their production or storytelling that the original has, which is why this one is still a cult classic that holds up today. If you've never seen Starship Troopers somehow, I mean, it's one of the more famous movies on this list, but if you've never seen it, strap in. It's a fun, wild ride you're not gonna soon forget. Another really wild ride that I have loved for years. In fact, there was a period where this was easily one of my favorite movies. I think I've matured a little bit over time, but I'm talking about Robert Rodriguez's conclusion to his epic trilogy, Once Upon a Time in Mexico. And when I say matured, I just mean I now like Desperado more than this one, but still, Once Upon a Time in Mexico is an awesome movie. It's a little bit sloppier than Desperado, but that's also what's kind of cool about it. This was at a time when Robert Rodriguez was really discovering and being a pioneer in digital movie making, and it changed the way he made things. You can tell when you watch this movie, he's moving the camera around a lot more. It's a lot more fast paced. The story suffers a little bit as a result, but it's made up for by some epic performances, including what's one of my favorite Johnny Depp performances. Not only are his little banter scenes fantastic, but the climax of the movie is one of his most badass moments ever. Everybody in this movie is just fantastic on screen. There's too many characters for it to really work. That's also what's sloppy about it. But they're all great. I mean, you've got Mickey Rourke, Eva Mendez, Willem Dafoe, and then Salma Hayek and Antonio Banderas are just doing some of their best and like most athletic work in this movie. So again, just a fun ride of a movie that is not a great movie, but is a just fantastic watch. Okay, now I've kind of talked about how weird movies are. My next pick is a Netflix original. It's easily one of the weirdest movies I've seen in recent years, and it's the one on this list that is going to, guaranteed, going to lose the most of you. I'm thinking of ending things. Now this was directed by Charlie Kaufman, who has directed a few movies, but he's more famous for the movies that he has written, which include Being John Malkovich, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and Adaptation. And as weird as all those movies are, I'm Thinking of Ending Things is still probably his weirdest movie. However, it presents itself as something very normal, a normal sort of family drama about a family getting together around the holidays. It's got some awkward humor, but it's really helped out by fantastic performances. This movie's got a really great cast. But then as soon as things take a weird turn, this movie never looks back, and it is a fever dream of a movie. That's all I wanna say. If that has interested you in the least, you like Kaufman's other work, or you like the sound of a fever dream, check out I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Okay, not only is my number one pick my strongest recommendation, it's also one of the weirdest movies on this list. Sorry to bother you. In this movie, Lakeith Stanfield plays a telemarketer who discovers he gets a lot more sales when he uses his white voice. And the white voice is something else. I'm not talking about Will Smith's wife, like this young blood. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. But this simple little gimmick works really well on screen. They continue to use it throughout the movie. And not only is it a funny gag voiced by David Cross there, but it propels the story really well, which is rare to have a gag that also propels the story well. This movie's got some funky scenes in it that again, work. I mean, the movie has style in droves, yet it's never style over substance. The style is the substance in Sorry to Bother You. Now, I do need to give you a warning with no spoilers that this movie gets incredibly out there the further it goes along, but that's also where it gets a lot of points. I mean, just the trajectory of weirdness with this one, just it starts and it just kind of doesn't stop. 
it got some big bonus points. The, the filmmaking here was done with a massive pair of balls. You can tell when you watch it and it doesn't always pay off, but for Sorry to Bother You, I think it did. That is the list. If you've got any additional recommendations, be sure to let us know in the comments down below. Who knows, one of your recommendations might make it onto a future video. If you'd like additional recommendations, please check out my website, darrenvandam.com. It's free to check out the recommendations on the homepage, and it's free to sign up for the weekly newsletter where I'll send you recommendations straight to your inbox. But I will keep making these videos as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this special Netflix list, and you will see me on the next one. Thank you.